Okay. Christina drove me to Santa Monica. What are we gonna do today? Harvest some eggs. Harvesting! 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 <laughs> We're gonna make a baby! Yeah! In college, my gay best friend and I joked that if we hadn't found love by 40, we'd have a baby with each other. 20 years later, I'm pulling the ripcord. From deciding on solo motherhood to choosing IVF, I'm Meredith, and this is The Backup Plan. Where did we last leave off? Okay, so if you have been watching this podcast in real time, I did not release an episode for a week there. Uh, so you're on a little bit of a delay now because things got overwhelming. They just did. I wasn't expecting that because I, I don't know, I, <laughs> I've joked in the past with friends that um, I sort of have a buffering response to like emotions and feelings and stuff like that. So all of the feelings that like maybe somebody would have along the way just like caught up with me all of a sudden and it was during trigger shot time and then I had recorded an episode and I went to edit it and something funky was happening in my editing software where everything was really like jittery and glitchy and I could edit but it was like a delayed response to everything I was trying to do and it was my anxiety was already going through the roof. So it just added more anxiety to the plate. And I said, you know what? We're going to just take this time and hang out. So trigger shot, egg retrieval, fertilization has all happened. So let's get into this. Let's cover it. My follicles weren't really behaving the way that we wanted them to. They weren't really responsive. Once we turn that medication up, well, baby, they responded really quickly. And I actually had to take Ganarelix, which keeps you from ovulating. I had to take an extra shot of that to hold it all in. We went from 12 follicles when I went for my first checkup to 20, which I was bananas about. I looked at my charts afterwards and I was just, I was so excited. Like <laughs> to see 20 just felt like a really good safe spot to be in. I would say like half of them were double digits. I didn't want to count out the little ones. I said, you know, maybe we can still get something out of that. Who knows? But it just felt good. Like it 20 felt really nice to go into the egg retrieval with. The trigger shots were a little bit intimidating in that I felt like I had to get all of them in in that 60 seconds when I hit nine o'clock. So when you go into this like trigger shot process, like you have one more extra time that you go into, in my case, the Kind Body RV in Newport Beach, but in other people's cases, an actual doctor's office. You go in for this like one final check to see where everything's at. That's where I saw the 20 follicles, got really excited, talked to the nurses. They kind of went over the shot process for me. The trigger shot really was not any different than setting up the other shots that I had. I think I'm trying to remember, I know I had to mix one of them, but I don't remember if the other one was already all set up. I've recorded it so I can go back and watch. And so they gave me a PDF about when to do the trigger shot. So my trigger shot was 9 p.m. on Thursday night. And then my retrieval was 8 a.m. on Saturday morning. So there's just like a very specific time. You're triggering your ovulation and it needs however many hours to get into your system. And so I was just nervous, like nine o'clock hit. I have a cuckoo clock that I got on my trip to Germany over the holidays. The cuckoo clock. And so the cuckoo's like, cuckoo, cuckoo. And I'm like, oh God, I've got to, uh, I got to like clean my belly. Oh, are my hands clean? And like, <laughs> I was nervous. So they all went in by like 901, which worked, it was fine. And then that next day was very strange because I'd been taking all these different shots, like morning shots, night shots throughout the time. And then that next day, I just didn't have anything to do except take a pregnancy test, which was fun because I was like, this is going to be positive. You know, I've taken all the shots correctly. It's going to be positive. And it was. So that was a very fun little like test run. <laughs> I will say at this point in the process, I finally felt a lot of the side effects and symptoms I was kind of expecting to feel the whole way you know, I was expecting to feel bloated and I finally did. It felt like I had two clementines in my belly. I had a little bit of the bloat. I've always joked that I have hereditary bloat. Like it's just part of my mom's side of the family. Like we just have little round bellies. I don't know that I ever got more bloated than I've ever gotten. Also as somebody with IBS, like 
We just, we just used to bloat. I would say that I started getting more hormonal. I would say that I started getting more anxious. I really did expect like more bodily things to happen to me though. Like I expected weird chin hairs and like crazy acne. And honestly, my skin was pretty clear the whole time, which I just thought was insane because I don't have good skin. So I don't know, maybe that's the progesterone part when it comes to the implantation. I took it easy. Like I just, I had had social plans that I canceled. I ended up doing a lot of sitting on the couch. I tried to go on some like gentle walks around the neighborhood because I was starting to feel a little bit more going on. Again, it's kind of like an indigestion thing where I was just kind of feeling stuff moving around in there. So I was so nervous about ovarian torsion, which is a side effect or it's something that can happen because your ovaries are so overstimulated that I guess they can like twist, twist and shout. I don't know. I was born with a hernia when I was a baby. And then when I was two, my mom was washing my hair and I didn't want to get my hair washed. So I sat and I just went and she watched me pop a second hernia out and my ovary came out. I don't know if it was with the one that I was born with or the one that I popped out, but My ovary popped out with it. So I'm always nervous about like my ovaries kind of like going wherever they please. So I was pretty nervous about this whole like ovarian hyperstimulation situation. Sometimes if I'm like twisted and I sneeze, I like feel it down there and I know it's my ovary. It's not my intestine or anything like that. So I'm just very careful about like, I am not going to twist. I am going to (laughs) sit very straight. Anytime I felt a sneeze coming on, I would be like, brace yourself, a chew. Thankfully, it doesn't seem like uh, the ovaries have gone anywhere. So good job, Meredith. For the actual egg retrieval, I was nervous about getting a ride. So Julian, who helps me out with the podcast from time to time, has been my like surgery buddy. And he took me for the last two foot things I had to do. Julian was there when there was an attempt in break-in at my house, if you'll recall, a couple weeks ago. But guess who else was also there? Christine Ariel, who you have met as a guest in the past. And when Julian wasn't able to come to the egg retrieval because it kept getting pushed back, Christina came through. And so she was my ride. I don't feel as bad asking her for that because she's actually a little bit closer to me than a lot of friends. So it ended up working out really well. So we had to be in Santa Monica at 7 a.m. And standard surgery procedures, which because of all the stuff that I've gone through on my foot, I'm very used to at this point. Just like you can't wear um, any jewelry. You have to have clean nails. If you start losing oxygen, your nails will turn blue. So, uh, you know, took off all my jewelry, took off all my nail polish, um, no makeup, no deodorant, no lotions. And I've learned like what kind of comfy clothes are easiest to like put on, take off, especially when you're under the effects of anesthesia. We got to Kind Body because it was a early, early on a Saturday morning, like street parking was super easy. Christina was not prepared for how nice the office was. I was like, you'll probably just want to hang out in the waiting room. And she was like, eh, all right. And then we got there and she was like, oh yeah, no, I'll hang out in this waiting room. They took me back pretty quickly. Um, what I liked about the Kind Body surgical facility is that, you know, it's only dedicated to that. Like I have been to these other surgery centers for my foot and stuff and they're just, you know, kind of barren and anybody can be in the waiting room. And it was nice to know that like everybody was there for the same thing. There were three egg retrievals that were happening on the day that I went in. So there was a woman before me and a woman after me. I was smack dab in the middle. You know, they take you back and they have these four little recovery rooms, which were basically like glorified walk-in closets. They were very tiny but they had these um, big recliners for you to sit in. Um, I mean, like hospital recliners. It would have been nice if they were like lazy boys, but <laughs> it was a like hospital recliner. And that's where they came in and they had me sign all the different forms for, you know, release. And they did my IV in there. I hate IVs because I just, oh, as soon, I don't mind needles, but like when an IV is in me and I know that like, oh, if I like bend my elbow, I'm going to feel it in there. Oh, uh, I hate, oh, I hate it. I hate it so much. I don't want to feel it in me. There was a gal that went in before me. So like, as I was coming in, she was taking her little basket of like the surgical gown and the little booties and everything. So she was walking into the bathroom to do that as I came in and sat down. And so then as they gave me my little basket to put my clothes in and to 
change into the surgical gown, she was being wheeled in. So then I'm sitting there and waiting. And um, I actually had a really long conversation with the nurse there. Her name is Lauren and she was really sweet. And she's recently gone through loss like I have. So we kind of like vibed and chatted about that. And it was just nice to have somebody to listen to me, especially in these moments where like, I'm saying, no, I'm fine. Like, I'm not anxious. It's totally cool. Don't even worry about it. I am. And so to just have somebody to talk to and go through a big moment with was really nice. And she was just really sweet. So by the time I was in my surgical gown and they had my IV in me, a new person was coming into another uh, recovery room, your prep room. And the other gal was coming out and they were very respectful too. Like the recovery rooms, it wasn't just like a curtain that they pulled across. Like it was a door. It was like a bifold door out of like beautiful white oak. And they would close that as the people went through or came back out for privacy, which was really cool. But I did hear the doctor come out and tell the first girl how many eggs they retrieved. And it was four. And I was like, oh, I don't want to hear that. Like I have 20 follicles, like a bunches of them are ripe. I don't want to hear the number four. I don't like, I didn't want to hear how they were relaying the information to her. Like to somehow to me, that was some kind of a projection thing, like into the future of like, that's what's going to sound like for you in mere moments. So I didn't like love that. And I was just nervous about that. And four is a lucky number for me, but in this case, I don't want four. I want more than four. So at that point, um, I, they had, they got, had me walk into the surgery room, which had like the most beautiful shade pink ceiling, which doctors, can we talk about ceilings? Like your patients are looking up at them a lot, like put something nice up there, at least a nice color. The pink was nice. (laughs) So I went in and at the table, you know, I stirrups are awful. Like they're just necessary, but terrible. And, uh, I got in And they're kind of explaining how, you know, they're setting things up and they're, you know, a guy came in at one point. And so everybody I've dealt with at this place is a woman. And so then all of a sudden a guy comes in and I have a blanket over me. So I like, I'm covered. However, I was like, sir, excuse you. And they're like, oh, this is Zach. He's the embryologist. And so I was like, oh shit, like that's the guy that's going to make my baby potentially, you know, in like in seconds. That was the wild thing about this whole thing is that like, You know, when Michael went in for his donation, he donated and we left and that was put into a freezer and we didn't think about it anymore. You know, when I have my thing done, I mean, first of all, I have to go to sleep. But second of all, by the time I wake up, stuff's already happening. You know what I mean? Like embryos are being made. And so it was just kind of such a trippy headspace to be in, to know that it was happening. Like there's no going back. Like it's really actually happening. Uh... I was told that Zach was really funny, I think, at that point. So at this point, like, they're starting to give me fluids because you can't eat or drink for 12 hours prior to the surgery or nine hours. They told me to stop after midnight, and then I was in at eight, so eight hours. Um, So I'm pretty thirsty at this point. I want my morning water, you know? Definitely hungry at this point. So then when they start the fluids, like, I'm feeling, it, it felt, like, kind of prickly a little bit, um, especially in my nether regions. It was very strange. And, uh, so they come in, Zach comes in, they're like, Oh, Zach, he's really funny. He's an embryologist, but they've taken my glasses off at this point, And I think they were starting to pump some more drugs into my system. It's really hard. If you have excellent vision, like good for you, I have terrible vision. So as soon as they take off my glasses, like I can't see anything clearly, like from here out, like I'm done. So the entire room is just foggy. And there's a man, I can tell he has a beard. And so because he has a beard, I'm already like more interested. And I was like, I think he's cute. Like I want him to come over and introduce himself closer so I can see the features of his face. Cause I want to see if like a cute bearded man is making my embryos. Any kind of nerves or anxiousness I have at the doctor's office immediately translates to like some sort of like vaudevillian like routine. Like I'm telling jokes, I am goofing around, like... I am on fire, basically, when I'm at the doctor's office. (laughs) Uh, Award-winning comedic performances. So, uh, yeah, they start pumping me. You know, they put the oxygen thing on my nose. I have arranged myself down, like, shimmied to the end of the table, and I've got myself in the stirrups. and, And the paper blanket is over me. Right before I went under, I know that I said, make me proud. And I was out. 
I do not remember how I got back into the recovery room. I don't know if I was walked. I don't know uh, if they like wheeled my chair in and then how they got me from the table to the chair. But really, that's not for me to worry about because I did. I made it and it's fine. Um, and so I slowly like started to wake up there. TBH, guys, I love anesthesia. Like it's such a, it's such a cool nap. Like <laughs> it's great. I think it's because my head is constantly going. And so like when I sleep, sometimes it's not even like great sleep because I'm like dreaming wild dreams as we've discussed in the past to have it all turn off is like truly magnificent. I woke up and the doctor came in and she told me that they had retrieved nine eggs, nine eggs, which is not bad considering, you know, the Monday prior to this, I was really worried about how I was responding to anything. And I was only seeing like a couple of eggs in the double digits. So then to get up to nine felt great. I had in my head the number eight for whatever reason. So nine felt like an overachievement, which is what every cell in my body is ever accustomed to. <laughs> So I was like, okay, cool. I surpassed whatever inner number I had guessed for myself. And I feel kind of good about that. I wanted double digits, but nine felt good. I FaceTimed my mom pretty immediately and was just like so drugged. And then I recorded myself, which for your benefit, they got nine. I feel good, even though my hat's crooked. Pretty good. I then FaceTime Michael, who, like, God bless him. I didn't know he had a race that day. And so he picked up his phone in the middle of the race. And he was like, normally I don't run with my phone. But I knew you had news coming. And so I told him nine. And he was, like, happy about that. And then I told him. I remember telling him to run like the wind bullseye. Then I took another video. Uh, this is a good one. Um, and I will narrate over it as we're playing it here. I am mugging for the camera. I don't, not attractively. And then they'd given me these Belveda cookies, which I thought were really good. So I was like, I gotta mark the occasion. <laughs> so I wish I'd recorded more, to be honest. <laughs> I wish I'd recorded more. I think I spent more time in recovery than I did like through the whole process. I kind of looked at the time markers. It seemed like I was in recovery for about an hour. It didn't feel like it. And then I came out and was texting Christina and she wasn't coming. So then I like FaceTimed her. She didn't stay in the waiting room. Turns out she went to Target next door. And then she FaceTimed my mom. And they talked for a good long while because my mom was like nervous about the process. And I think Christina was too. So they... um they just stayed on the phone with each other. And then she was uh, a little late coming to get me because she was gabbing with my mom. Those two, I tell you what. So from there, I was told to, uh, you know, very slowly bring the food back into my diet. And I did not listen to that advice and got Wendy's breakfast and it was good and it was fine. My stomach was fine. Now, the egg retrieval was on Saturday. We are now at Wednesday is when I'm recording this. I, my stomach has been weird since then because the anesthesia kind of stops you up. Um, maybe it's bloat from my ovaries, but honest to God, it feels just like gas in my stomach. So I've been chewing gas X like they're going out of style and, uh, I know it'll regulate and stuff, but such is the life of a poorly constructed gastrointestinal system. The rest of the day after that, I, I, thought I was going to come home and watch TV. Honestly, I just like scrolled through my phone all day. I kept switching positions like my bed, the couch and stuff like that. It was pretty easy. I think I ordered food that day. I don't remember what I ordered. I just took it easy. I was assimilating nine into my head, you know, and uh, realized like, oh, number nine is like a Beatles thing. And that feels good. The Beatles were part of my childhood. So Number nine, number nine, number nine, like felt good. It felt right. I was not expecting to get a call the next day because it was Sunday. And I was told that I might not get an update on the fertilization process until Monday. So Sunday was just going to be like 
a nothing day for me. Again, I had I had plans uh, that I had to unfortunately cancel because of the egg retrieval getting moved around and everything. So I was very surprised on Sunday morning when I got a call from an unknown number. I have learned to pick them up right now because the process I'm in. And it was my doctor. She said, I'm calling you for my kids swim meet. So I'm sorry if there is noise. I was like, no, I hear nothing. So she asked me how I felt about the number nine. And I was like, great. And I kind of went through everything I just went through here. And then she said, well, we, uh, we have an update and I wanted to call you and let you know about it before you saw it in the portal and kind of had some questions. And I was like, okay. <laughs> what is that? And she said, of the nine that were retrieved, three were mature. I felt very numb when she said that because that is a big drop. It's a big drop. I was kind of like, I was kind of working with a 50% attrition rate in my head. So I was kind of hoping that, you know, I mean, I was hoping all of them would be mature, but uh, at least 50%, right? So like four or five. Although three isn't far off from four, is it? So (laughs) um, she told me that three were mature, but all three fertilized. And I feel much better about that now than I did in the moment. Uh, I did not feel good about it in the moment at all. Um, A drop from nine to three is huge. And like, I wasn't prepared for an update. I was prepared to live with the number nine all day Sunday. So that was just hard. It would be much easier if I knew you're getting an update now, you're getting an update now, you're getting an update now. It's kind of been like a malleable, you're probably going to hear about this time. Speaking of which, I could hear any moment now how those three fertilized eggs have progressed through the week. Anyway, anywhere from today to like Friday, I could know. And so we just keep looking at the phone and I, I felt like wildly let down on Sunday. Um, I told people that if if it had been like six eggs were mature and three fertilized, like for whatever reason, like that like step down approach would feel better to me, even if it's the same outcome, because it just feels like if it can drop by six, then I could just lose it all at the end. And on Saturday... I was feeling so good with nine eggs retrieved. And I remember like calling my mom very specifically at this one moment and being like, I don't think I have to do this again. Like nine eggs is great. And we should get something out of that. We could get two rounds out of that. Like if I can make two embryos out of that, three embryos, that'd be great. And now I have been in a space over the last couple of days where it's like, if I have, if I only have three that that could totally drop again. And I may have to go through all of this again. And I don't want to. (laughs) Who wants to? Anybody who's at this position doing IVF, like does not want to do what they're doing. Uh, They just want it to happen. So it's been really tough. The thing that has been strange to me is a lot of people, when I tell them three fertilized, they're like, oh my God, that's amazing. And that's not the response I'm expecting and it throws me for a loop. And uh, I don't know, I'm just, because I've been in a more positive, I don't know, because I've been able to sit with it now, three doesn't feel so awful. I've been referring to them as Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Although I was typing to my mom and I <laughs> called them Huey, Dewey, and Louise, which made me laugh really hard. Um, three could be great. And what if all three make it? That could be a uh, very cool. So you know, why did it drop from nine to three? Uh, it could be because my body didn't respond to the drugs until the end. It could be that. So if I do have to go through this again, we can do a different, um, routine dose or whatever to mature them up a little bit faster at the beginning. When I called Mike and I told him that we had three fertilized, he was like, are you mad at your doctors? And I was like, no, <laughs> that's not how it works. I said, you know, it's because my body maybe didn't respond to the drugs. And he was like, well, are you mad they didn't give you more? And I was like, well, that's not really how it works. Because I think his, his thought process as I was explaining it was that, well, since my body wasn't responding, I should have stayed on the drugs longer and waited for the retrieval. And I was like, I don't think you can wait much longer than I waited. I think there's a certain point where like, you got to get them out or you're going to pop. So 
so in the past week, like dealing with that, I've dealt with some more family drama that's really kind of come to a head. So I reached out to a new therapist and I have a therapist now. I have not had one for a couple of months. And, you know, it's funny, like you go, when you go to therapy and you kind of like build up this like callus and you're like, I'm good. I can face the world. Like, look at all this like emotional work I've done. And suddenly like the callus gets shaved off and you're like, oh shit, I got to go back. I got to go back. Here's my routine for finding a therapist when you don't have one. I go to my insurance website and I go to like find a provider, find care or whatever. And I'll do a filtered search of like, you know, therapy, psychology, whatever it's going to be in the drop down menu. Right. Um, I'm always looking for women. So I click women and, you know, in the near area. So that's going to show you which therapists take your insurance and then from there, if there are profiles to read, I'll go through and like read the profile of, of what they specialize in. If I can cross-reference their name with like a Google search, some kind of a review of their services, I'll do that. And then I kind of have like a blanket email that I'll send out to like two or three of them because a lot of times, you know, the profiles are outdated. They're not accepting new patients, whatever. So I'll send out an email that's like, hi, I'm Meredith. Uh, I'm looking for a therapist, you know, with this kind of experience or whatever, found your name through my insurance portal. Are you accepting new patients? And I'll send that out to the two or three, wait to see who replies back. And it's, you know, it's really good if they have their own website too. And I do that cross-reference because then their own website has a little bit more information about what they do and, and what they're specializing in. So I went to my insurance website this time to find that. And I noticed a little portal that said like, um, spring health for, you know, mental, uh, wellness or what, you know, whatever buzzwords we're using right now. And turns out it's this whole portal where I went in and I, I put in again, what I'm looking for. And I was able to book an appointment like immediately through that rather than asking them if they are available or accepting patients. I was lucky that with the search terms, I was working within the filtered search I found somebody who in their profile says, I deal specifically with, you know, fertility issues, postpartum, blah, blah, blah. And I was like thrilled. I was like, this is too good to be true. And she had an appointment the next day. I was sure that like I was going to click it and then get an email and be like, actually, this therapist died or something wild, right? Like I was like, this is way too easy, but it worked. And she was really lovely. And I was able to talk through the family issues that I'm dealing with. I mean, those aren't fixed, but I was able to give her the primer on it all. And then she had some uh, questions for me about where I'm at in the process. And because she deals so specifically with fertility issues, like when I say to her something like, oh, and suddenly like I had 20 follicles, she knows what that means in the process. I didn't have to like explain to her, this is how many I should have. And this is how many a normal person has. And here's how many I thought he, like she knew. And she went through like kind of a basic rundown of like, here's where I see you in the fertility process. Cause I work with women who do this all the time. And so, you know, having a baby is like a book and here are the different chapters you're at. I would say you're kind of at like chapter three and you know, what are your desires? And I was able to explain to her that like, it's, it is my wish to be a mother, not necessarily to have a child but that I'm taking advantage of the ability to have a child while I can. And if it doesn't work, that's fine. We're going to find other things. And what's really cool too, is that she has worked in the, um, the social worker scene. And she said, if adoption is something you want to do or foster care is something you want to do, I can direct you through those sorts of, um, scenarios. So that's really cool. And then she told me, I had no idea this was an option. There are embryo adoptions available of parents who have created embryos and aren't going to use them for reasons X, Y, Z, and, but they don't want them destroyed or they don't want them donated to science or whatever. So you can actually do embryo adoption, which is wild to me. And I don't know if I'm interested in it or not, but it's uh, crazy. This world is crazy, isn't it? I mean, in a good way, sometimes. <laughs> so that's where I'm at. Next up that you're going to get is how many little embryos I have. Let's, let's go for three. Let's just say all three make it. Maybe they're all just really strong. Huey, Dewey, and Louie just kicking it together. You know, I would like that. That would be nice. And if not, we figure out the next steps. 
I feel like I can do another egg retrieval if I have to. My thought process at this point is that I can do probably like three embryo transfers. So if one more egg retrieval and three embryo transfers don't work, then that's where we really seek out other options. But we don't think about that now. We're just thinking about right now in this moment, I have three fertilized eggs. So wish me well. Thanks for hanging in there for that little week long break. I'm glad to have a little bit of breathing room because it allows me to edit these videos when I am emotionally able to. And it gives me a little bit of breathing room from like a lot of people checking in at me all at once, which was really nice at first. And then really overwhelming all of a sudden. Uh, if you have reached out, thank you. It's very sweet. My brain and soul just like can't take too much of it all at once. So if I don't respond back to you, it's not a slight. It's just that in a lot of cases, I have to just like nose to the grindstone, get through my day. There are especially there are times where like, I just cannot be emotional. Like eight o'clock to like 11 a.m., I have to set myself up for the day. And then once I hit like lunchtime is like where my brain kind of gets into a little bit more of a holistic space and I can contemplate the universe. But if I don't get my day started, like doing work, I will devolve into like a pretty shitty spot kind of swirl down the toilet bowl a little bit. And then like my entire day is wasted. So I got to get as much done as I can from eight to 11. So, um, for the rest of the week I have, I'm going up to San Francisco with Christina for a quick little work thing. And, uh, I have a comedy show I'm going to, I have a lunch that I'm going to. So I have the rest of my week is stacked so that I don't have a lot of time to wallow because my, again, my own being, if I sit and really think about it all at once, I'm gone. But if I can think about it in little chunks and process it kind of slowly, I get through it better. It's the, you know, it's like, it's, it's the difference between like eating a cheeseburger while you drive or like sitting down to like a five course meal. You know what I mean? <laughs> I have to do the five course meal with my emotions. I cannot do cheeseburger on the road because I will drive off the road. That's where I'm at. Um, so there you go. Nice little analogy on the way out. Now I want a cheeseburger. The Backup Plan is created, produced, and hosted by me, Meredith Kate. Julian Hagens is my co-producer. You can find us on social media at Backup Plan Pod. The best place to get updates is to sign up for our newsletter at BackupPlanPod.com, where we also post all episodes, show notes, and transcripts. Thank you for listening.